spent about uh, five years during the late 90s helping redesign, uh, trying to redesign the elder care services for frail elderly in the United States at a high level. I have two questions for you. I think this is very good stuff. And we, we, had, we talked around it, but nobody ever crystallized it as nicely as you've done in such a short period of time. I shouldn't be surprised, but it's nice to hear. So I have two questions, and I would not be displeased to have a long answer. Um, two questions. One, if, have you given any thought to the biological differences of great-grandparents these days compared to grandparents before? Because there are some significant differences <coughs> biologically that does have an impact on roles and responsibilities or potential, I think. And second, if you're in a position to give some advice about how to redesign from a societal level. So the first question sort of had to do with the family level. But from a societal level, if you had a chance to give some advice about how we would do things fundamentally differently that might lead to a major breakthrough, have you given any thought to that, you or your colleagues? Because I'd be interested in any thoughts on either one of those questions. Uh, now, as far as we're talking about the biological differences between great grandparents today and grandparents in the past. Yes. Um, what, I'll give you I, an example. what I was saying was that in terms of, of their health levels, um, I mean, obviously, they're taking a lot of medications, for instance. A lot of chronic illnesses are being controlled by medication. Uh, in order to give them the, the, the level of, of health, they would have... One, one, of the major, one of the major issues, I should have been more clear in my question, yeah. one of the major issues about people biologically is that even though we're able to enhance their longevity through, you know, better living through chemistry, we should joke about it, now it's us, okay? And while you can do it in terms of their overall health care, and that does significantly improve their ability to live longer and higher quality of life. There does seem to be a significant spike and increase in mental acuity after a certain age that we don't run into in previous generations because there weren't enough people living that long. So better than 50 to 60 percent roughly of people over 85 have some form of significant dementia. So even if they're physically in great shape, they do not have the same capability. And that does not show up in earlier generations of grandparents in the same percentages. I was just wondering if you could give any thought those kinds of implications for this, for, for the social, family, other role, because I like a lot of the rest of it. It's just a fine tune. Um, well, it's interesting because although the, uh, the onset of the dementias okay. is later, but notice that the traditional picture of grandparents is of senility. I mean, it's before anybody named Alzheimer's. Right. Uh, that, that you get mental deterioration partly as a result of inactivity, right. partly as a result of, of withdrawing from different kinds of interaction. Uh, so I, I, I think and also, I think we're beginning to, to when, we, when we talk about the level of activity of these people and engaging them with the world, we're talking about something that is going to significantly improve their health, right. including their mental health. Uh, you're, still, you're still raising a fair question. You're still going to have people with chronic disease. We're going to have frail old people. Uh, and they're not going to be marching on the White House uh, necessarily for all their remaining years. They've got some remaining years to do it. That's really what I'm trying to say. And I'm, and I'm fully in favor of that. I mean, all the old is still going to be there. I didn't ask your second question. We can talk later. Okay. Do you have a question? Um, I was curious about the, uh, the economic uh, question that comes up in terms of um, who is obligated to care. And it seems that there's a shift in that. Um, and it seems from what you're saying is that um, care is becoming voluntary. And that, I can see, is sort of ambiguous in that it becomes a controversial issue to organize around and to look at how, in general, the society doesn't really care for everybody, and also specifically within families, 
who actually feels like they're supposed to be caring for whom. Um, and then also there's the, uh, the problem with that, and that there's kind of a gap not filled. There's certainly a gap that's not filled. Uh, one of the interesting things here, quite aside from grandparents fostering children, is how many of the activities that women did before they went back into the workplace are being done by seniors, uh, whether babysitting or as volunteers in the community, uh, so that there's a kind of replacement there. But I do think uh, part of the, the pattern that has been created by social insurance um, is the expectation that people would not have to be cared for by their children and that this would be dealt with through societal institutions uh, which are under threat at the moment and under strain. So it's hard to know exactly how that's going to play out. But, I mean, if you think of the... Michael Harrington, The Other America. Remember that book? Yeah. In, in the 60s, really exposed to poverty in America. It was about old people eating dog food. The, the, among the worst off groups in the United States were the old, and that was people over 60, maybe younger than that. That has been fixed largely, which isn't to say that there aren't poor people in every age group, and that there aren't injustices, and there aren't people who can't get the maximum available potential medical care. Um, but the AARP and other organizations advocating for old people have had been extraordinarily successful. What I would like to see is old people advocating for health insurance for children and their own children who are adults who might be unemployed and not have health coverage. Um, uh, and I think that advocacy is there. Mm -hmm. And so the, at that point, people cease to be objects of care uh, and become advocates and givers of care. And I mean, I think one of the things we need to think about all of these gen generational things, we are being taught by our children all the time now. We don't teach them only, they teach us. Uh, children care for parents, parents care for children. These are all cyclical, mutual relationships rather than one-way linear relationships. Uh, and the more we can do to institutionalize that and make people aware of it, I think the better. <laughs>